you have a Bible this morning, turn with me to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. Continue the series in Jonah this morning. We left off Jonah upon his call to repentance and pay the vows that he owed to God. Many Christians make vows to God. Lord, I'll do this and I'll do that. And they feel the call of God in their life and then they recant for their own agenda, their own desires. And that often can place you firmly in the stomach of a fish of God's discipline. Jonah called out to God. He remembered the Lord and it says the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. The word of the Lord came to Jonah again, said, Go to Nineveh and preach against it. Their wickedness has come up before God. We come to verse 4 this morning, Jonah chapter 3. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk. And he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. As far as we know, that's Jonah's entire message. Many people would like uh, a preacher that was that predictable and they could plan their lunches at a sooner time on Sunday if that was all there was. Uh, I don't know if Jonah said more or not, but under the inspiration of Almighty God, that is what is included here, but I have a feeling that was all he said. He went through the town and when he crossed the city limits sign, if there was such a thing. Jonah began to cry out and say, 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. All their wickedness, all their violence, their evil that had come up before God, Jonah, at the instruction of the Lord, was crying against it. His message was clear. It was simple. It was a sober message of warning. The gospel should be clear. The gospel is simple. And the gospel at first is a sober message of warning or it is no gospel at all. People have confused what the gospel is. People make it a life improvement. People make it a positive mindset. People make it self-help. That's not what the gospel is. The gospel at first comes as a sober warning to the sinner's heart. As is stated in the book of Romans, the gospel begins with there is none righteous, no, not one. Not of their own accord, not of their good deeds, the words of their mouth, the intentions of their heart, no, not one. The warning comes in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Short of being able to come into His presence by your own good works, by your own merits. Short of deserving His mercy or His grace. We all fall short of the glory of God. And the warning comes in Romans chapter 6, the wages, the price for sin is death. That is the message Jonah brought and that is the message to the unrepentant sinner today. The price for sin is death, but then the good news comes, the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. The gospel is simple. Jonah spoke it. He was called of God to Nineveh. All of us are called to somebody. He was not called to Babylon. He was not called to Rome, New York, or Las Vegas. He was called to Nineveh. I am called to my neighbors. I am called to people that God puts in my path. I am called to people in restaurants at times, friends that he has placed in my life, but they are different than who he has called you to, but we all have a Nineveh. If you are a believer in Christ today, if you have been saved from your dead trespasses and sins and made alive in Christ Jesus, then you are called to somebody. And he will show you your Nineveh. He will place you there. He will arrange divine appointments. He will open doors of conversation and opportunity. And when he does, we are called to speak the message of the simple gospel. 
Many people think the gospel is living it out. You challenge people, well, how are you sharing the gospel? People will say, well, I live the gospel every day, and that's good. How do you do that? People say, well, I'm nice to people, I'm generous, I'm helpful, I'm compassionate, I mow my neighbor's yard, I let them borrow things, I give people money when they need it. I want them to see the gospel in me. That isn't the gospel. That is the fruit, that is the byproduct of you being a Christian. That is the evidence that might cause their heart to ask you the question, Why did you do that for me? Why are you so kind? Why are you compassionate? Why are you generous? Why are you forgiving? That might be the key, your deeds, that opens the door for you to walk in there and preach the gospel. Jesus did not call us to go into all the world and just live the gospel and hope people see it. He called us to go into the world and preach the gospel. He didn't tell Jonah to go into Nineveh and walk around and start raking leaves for people and hope somebody saw it and understood it. You understand? He said, go to Nineveh and cry against it. And so he showed up to Nineveh, he cried out and said. When God opens the door and we don't say the words and we don't issue the full warning that we are dead in our trespasses and sins and the grace of God has appeared in the person of Jesus Christ and he was nailed to the cross and the death he died, he died to sin once for all and all who call upon his name will be saved. And we don't say those kinds of words. We collapse in cowardice and fear. We have not preached the gospel. So he preached 40 days God's judgment. God's wrath righteously will be applied to your wicked hearts. That's true then and that's true now. And when they heard it, because it wasn't up to Jonah's ability to communicate and isn't up to ours either, the anointing of God was on his call. When God gives you a moment, when he opens a door, the anointing power of the Holy Spirit can cut to the sinner's heart beyond your ability to persuade them. It wasn't up to Jonah to persuade them with masterful speeches. It wasn't up to him to be uh, wildly charismatic and draw people to the power of his words. The power was God telling him to go and say these things. It was God's message, not his. Same is true of us. And when they heard God's message and they were convicted by God's spirit, verse 5 happens. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God. That's amazing. Wicked, wretched, hard-hearted sinners, violent, evil, idolatrous, lustful, greedy. They called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. They believed in God. The Bible says Abraham believed in God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He just believed it. By faith, Abraham believed in God. Martha, Jesus came to Martha, New Testament, and he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never perish. He will live even if he dies. He said to Martha, do you believe this? And I would echo Jesus' words this morning and ask you the question, do you believe it? Sitting here today. Martha, do you believe that? And she said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. She believed it. He said, tax collectors and prostitutes have believed in me. They believed it. They surrendered their soul, their lives, their sin, and he nailed it to the cross, transformed their mind, made them a new creation. They believed it, and he did all the work to save them. Nineveh believed in God. But Jesus said in John chapter 6, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe There were people there that day when Jesus said that. They heard him say that. And there are people here now this morning that heard him say it. He said, I'm giving you spirit and life, the words that I have spoken to you, he said. But there are some of you who do not believe. There might be people that hear it as there were in Nineveh, as there were in Noah's day even. 
as the Pharaoh of Egypt heard it, when Moses and Aaron came uh, under the orders of Almighty God with the very word of God in their mouth, Pharaoh heard it. Janus and Jambres, the false prophets of Pharaoh, heard it. They might have even felt it as they saw the power of God by signs confirming the word. The people in Noah's day, seeing the animals board the ark as Noah stood by and preached, they heard it and they saw the evidence that it was real, that it was powerful, and it might have even cut to their heart. And Jesus said, though, some of you do not believe. Some people, they hear the message, and there might be someone here today hearing the message, and you hear it, and you might even feel it. I have seen people's faces change with conviction. Change when the word of God, which the Bible says in Hebrews 4, is a double-edged sword that cuts to the very depths of our heart and reveals the thoughts and intentions of our heart. It shows us our sin at the deepest level, calls us to repent and believe, and let Jesus nail it to the cross when we cannot. And I have seen that look on people's faces for years where they just sit there, stoic. Some might call it the thousand-yard stare, right? It's not the stare of boredom, which I have seen that too. (laughs) I know the difference. It's okay. But I have seen people staring, and I can see their soul turning And as the word of God goes forth and the spirit of God does his work, people hear it. The Bible says today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. And people have heard his voice. They heard Jesus' voice. And he said there are some of you who do not believe. The people in Noah's day heard it and they saw it. They might have even felt the pull. The rich young ruler, he felt that conviction and he was drawn close to Jesus. But he did not believe. The people of Noah's day did not believe. The Pharaoh of Egypt, he would not believe even when God was raining power down from the skies above. He did not believe. The Bible says he hardened his heart against the Lord. Do you believe it? People hear it. People say, I even understand it. But Jesus said, some won't believe it. Nineveh believed it. Those wicked people were cut to the heart and they believed it. And they surrendered their lives in that moment of conviction. You saw the change begin to happen. You saw sorrow that leads to repentance happen. Verse 6. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth and sat on the ashes. He issued a proclamation and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water, but both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. And look what he says. Let men call on God earnestly, sincerely, truly, that each may turn from his wicked way. That's what repentance means, to turn. Some of us, man, we've said we believe, but we haven't turned from a thing. Turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. He says, who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. The Bible says that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, saved from the wrath of God, saved from his burning anger that is justifiably upon us because we are wicked in our heart. Saved, all who call upon the name of the Lord. But seemingly a paradox, Jesus comes along in Matthew's gospel and he says, many will say to me on the day of judgment, Lord, Lord. And he said, I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, all you who practice lawlessness. So which is it? Is it all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved? Or is it many will say to him, Lord, Lord, and he will say, I don't know you. How are we understanding that? About a month ago, 
I had some, uh, our friends here from Cuba, my friend Vladimir and his wife Mary, love those guys, faithful servants of the Lord down in Cuba. Um, they, they haven't been out of Cuba like a lot in their life. <laughs> so it was real cold when they were here. And they, we drove by a nearby lake and they saw people on the ice fishing with snowmobiles and four-wheelers and it blew their minds. They're like, is, is, that, is that a lake? Is that water? We're like, yes. Like, and it, it's going to hold those people? Like, basically, are those people going to die soon? Like, what's going on out there? You know, it was when it was real cold, polar vortex time, right? It was, ice was like this thick. And where we were headed to was to a friend of mine's house who lived on that same lake. And the reason was is... I had pre-planned to put them on a snowmobile on the lake. And I said, well, all your questions will be answered soon. And we pull into my buddy's driveway, and we go in, and he's got clothes ready. And he's like, well, I want you to put this on, and this is a helmet. And he, and he puts the helmet on. Well, where are we going to ride? Like, and we come down to the seawall by the beach, and, and, and I, Vladimir's wife was looking like, you know, it's right there, and, and my buddy's standing on the ice. There's a snowmobile parked right there. There's guys all over the ice fishing, and you can see people walking around, and she's, she's looking like, and, and, and so, I mean, they just couldn't believe it. Now, if you'd ask them or anybody like them, do you believe that ice can hold a man? Yeah. They would say yes. Many of you, everyone would say, if you saw somebody out there, you're like, <coughs> Yeah. Yeah, obvi- I mean, obviously it can. Do you believe the ice is powerful enough to hold you? Mm-hmm. I mean, if it holds that big guy out there who's bigger than me in that snowmobile or whatever, it could hold me. Yes, it could. I believe that. Now, some people would say that, but they would never step out there. Well, Vladimir's wife, she, you know, she, she steps out on the ice, you know, like it's going to crack, and, and it doesn't. And they get on the snowmobile and they ride off and it's great. It's like that. Some people, they believe God from a distance. If I were to say to some people here, do you believe in God? People say, yeah. You believe in Jesus? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Do you believe he saves people? Yeah, like who? Like this guy, that guy, the other guy. They've seen him save. Do you believe the ice can hold? Yeah, it holds that guy. Yes, Jesus held this person's sin on the cross. Do you believe it? Yeah, I believe it. I, I, it must be true because this person changed and this person changed. And, they, and I see the difference. And, uh, you know, just I, I see the effect of the Lord 2,000 years later. I believe it. Do you believe that the death he died is big enough that the blood he shed can cover your sin? And they might say, yeah, I believe it. But they've never given their sin to Jesus to be nailed to the cross. Do they believe he could? Do do they believe he did? Yeah. But they've never stepped out by faith and given their soul to him and truly called on him as Lord. That's an eternal difference. All who call upon the name of the Lord, but for real. Nineveh believed in God for real. The Pharisees said they believed in God, and Jesus said, you guys are sons of the devil. They call on God. Many, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, but Jesus said, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. Those are the people that believed it from a distance and said it from a distance and claimed they knew the Lord, but they never gave themselves to the Lord. And they're not saved. And he will say to them, I never knew you. When the king believed it, and when people today believe it, you see the fruit of repentance. You see the evidence of repentance. You see the power of the gospel that has changed somebody's life. The Bible says if any man, any woman, any child, any person in here truly believes, if any man be in Christ, your soul, your sin, your eternity, in the Lord's hands... He, she, is a new creation. Old thing, listen, listen, old things are passed away and all things have become new, new. You can see it. Look what the king did, verse six. 
When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne. Look at these powerful words. Laid aside his robe, his royal robe. And what did he do? He hung that up, he put it aside, and he covered himself with sackcloth and sat on the ashes. That is a symbol of sorrow, of mourning, of grief over his sin, that he has grieved God, that he has warranted the judgment of God. That is a visible appeal to God to mercifully forgive him and save him. And you saw it. Everybody saw it. And he laid aside his robe. I think about that. Uh, The Bible says in Romans chapter 13, let us, those that know the Lord, let us lay aside, listen, the deeds of darkness. Lay aside. Put on the armor of light. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. No allowance. No open doors. So when we are saved, when someone is really changed, you are able to see it. The power of the gospel make them a new creation. Transform their mind. They, you, they lay aside the robe of their former life. The Bible says you crucify the flesh and its sinful desires. So they lay it aside. They they lay aside lust. They lay aside pride. They lay aside bitterness. They lay aside anger. They lay aside where their feet used to walk and the people they were around and the words that come out of their mouth and the thoughts they allowed in their head and the images before their eyes. They laid it aside when they came to the cross in sackcloth and ashes, sorrow that leads to repentance, which leads to salvation. And they put on the armor of life. They put Put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were transformed by miraculous power, and everybody can see it. Some people, man, they name the Lord, they claim the Lord, they say they believe in the Lord. They've never changed their robe. The Bible says when we repent and believe, He clothes us in robes of righteousness and garments of salvation. Everybody can see it. I went to school in this town, grew up in this town. I'm a Fenton Tiger. Okay, amen, yep. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> We're the best, you're the worst, it's all right. <laughs> I remember in school, we, uh, one year they had these black uh, sweatshirts that came out. And it had a big uh, orange embroidered mean looking tiger on the front of it. And it was cool, man. It was like $500. <laughs> no, I don't know what it was, but I had one. And I, I used to wear it around and I was so proud of that. I was on the football team and stuff. I was a Fenton Tiger. I had a cool sweatshirt. And I used to wear that sweatshirt around. Wear it in the grocery store open to run into someone from another school and be like, come on, come on. Your mascot, your mascot is food to this one. You know, it's like, you know, I was so proud of that. I wasn't ashamed. I wasn't embarrassed. I just, it was cool. People, they wear um, their uh, shirt for the company they work for. No guilt. No, they're proud, not in a sinful way, but in a grateful way. You're, you're, you're proud of the reputation. You're thankful to have a job there. You're, you believe in the product. You believe in the mission of the company, the integrity of the, the business where you work and those you work for. So you wear it around, right? You have a little uh, embroidered something on a collared polo golf shirt or something or a nice dress shirt, and people say, oh, <coughs> do you work for them? And you're, you're happy and you're grateful in your heart to say, yes, I do. Wow, that must be a great job. It's a great job good company I hear. It's a great company. And, and you're excited that people know and you're proud and, you, and you're like, I, I represent them and I want to represent them well. You wear the hat, you know, whatever. Favorite college team, it's basketball season. How far do you want to go, you know? And, and so we wear our jersey around. My school won the basketball game and it's better than your school, all this stuff. And we're, we're so proud of all these things. I went to school there all 50 years ago and I'm still cool and could still play on the team if I had to. <laughs> Some people are better representatives of a company, a college, a high school than they are the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, guys. Come on, people of God. 
He said, put on the armor of light. You know the Lord? Put it on. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Lay aside the deeds of darkness. Make no provision for the lust of the flesh. People got no problem naming their school. Got no problem naming their company. Not, got no problem naming their politics. They're bold. They're, they're righteous in their indignation against the other side. And they'll say, I'm not ashamed. And, and they'll burn down relationships. They'll, they'll fly their flag proudly for what they claim to believe in this world. But when it comes to Jesus Christ, nobody knows. Nobody knows. Somebody comes and they're like, well, why are you so nice to me? Why are you comp- why'd you rake my lawn? And the answer is because I'm a servant of the high king of heaven and he has told me to represent him in this way. And if I could have a moment, I'd like to tell you why, what that's about, that I was once a sinner, you're a sinner. He said, he said people collapse in fear and cowardice. They will wear a school more than they will wear the G- Lord Jesus Christ. So the question comes, am I the judge of the souls of men in here? No, I am not. I have no idea where you're going to spend your eternity. I don't know what's real. I don't know what's fake. But if you will wear the things of this world more boldly than you will wear the Lord Jesus Christ, the question has to be asked. Do you really know him? Have you really been transformed? When that king believed in God, the town saw it. The robe got hung up, the sackcloth got put on, and he declared, he, pro- he proclaimed what he had believed. Everybody needs to do this, he said. Everybody. And you could see it, and he was bold. It was all you could see in him. Amen, Has anyone ever come to you and said, hey, um, there's something different about you. I, can I ask, is, is there something different? There's... There's, there's something, is there, is there, there's a joy in your face, is there this and that, and you, know, you used to talk a certain way, you used to go, I notice you don't go here anymore, how come? Does anybody, anybody ever say that to you? If you say, man, uh, no, do you know the Lord? And then you say, no, that's never happened. I'm not trying to guilt you, I'm just, let's ask yourself some questions. Can they see Christ in you, the hope of glory, if you claim to know him? And if they can't, why not? Have you really put on the Lord Jesus Christ today? The Bible says in verse 10, when God saw their deeds, it wasn't their deeds that saved them, it was their deeds that proved them. Same as true of us. And that they turn from their wicked way. When we know the Lord, we turn from our wicked way. We don't dabble, we don't hang around, we don't keep a foot in both worlds. We turn from it. And then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. There's a judgment coming upon sinners for their sin, that we are dead in our trespasses and sins, but when we believe in the Lord and put on the Lord Jesus Christ, he takes our sin, puts it on the cross, and the judgment happened there, and the judgment that was coming to us, he did not do it. Have you believed in God, believed in God today? Do you know him? Are you saved from the wrath of God as much as Nineveh believed it? Would you bow for prayer this morning? I mean, somebody today, you say, man, Wes, I don't know. I just don't know. Okay. I was praying today God would send somebody like that through the door. Maybe you're here. Maybe you're watching somewhere. Great. You say, man, I don't know. You read these verses, you ask these questions. The Spirit of God may be talking to your heart. Somebody here, if you're being honest with your soul, you might say, you know, I don't know if I'm saved. I believed in religion, you can say. I've abided by ritual. I don't know if I've ever really surrendered to Jesus. If you have, when did that happen? When did the change happen? When did you lay aside the robe of this world and put on the Lord Jesus Christ and let him clothe you with garments of salvation? When did that happen? You say, man, I don't know if it has. Okay? Somebody young or old, you say, well, what do I need to do? I feel something stirring in my heart. You need to do what Nineveh did. It says they called on God earnestly, truly, 
not ritualistically, not religiously. They called on God from an honest and sincere heart. You need to call out to God right now to be saved. Ask him to save you right now in your heart. All who call truly upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He will save you. He will change you. If you're unsettled with your eternity today, if you're unsettled with who Jesus is and whether or not you're saved, I'll give you a moment. Call on God right now. Right now. ways all your past all your guilt, all your shame give it to the Lord, ask him to save you right now Transform your mind. The Bible says he can take out a heart of stone and give us a new heart. Fill you with his Holy Spirit. First John chapter 5 says, He who has the Son has the life, but he who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Do you have the Son today? Because you truly have believed in him. pray for you in just a moment. The Bible says that when people believed in the gospel truly and they were changed, one of the first evidences that people could see of a true change was through the waters of baptism. It didn't save them, but it was a declaration. It was the story of their salvation. They had believed in the death, burial, and resurrection. They'd repented of sin. They'd been cleansed by the power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus paying the price for their, their sin at the cross. And they would come to the waters wherever there was much water, the scripture says, and they would be baptized calling on the name of the Lord. They would declare, I am a Christ follower. If you believed in the Lord today and you'd like to be baptized and say it out loud, lay aside the robe of your past and your sin, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel not ashamed to name him as my savior. We have the water ready. We have clothes ready. We have people in the hallway to answer questions ready. I want to pray for you. I'm going to ask you to stand. If you want to be baptized, we're going to invite you to come. Heavenly Father, I come before you today and I pray you give somebody courage. Somebody maybe has just now settled it with you. Somebody that has just called on your name, maybe for the first time ever that was for real. They've settled their soul at the cross of Christ this morning. They're ready to lay aside their old robe and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray you give them boldness, strength, that if you're calling them, if your Holy Spirit is speaking to their heart, that they would come and they would say, I am a Christ follower. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, would you stand this morning, please? If God's talking to your heart, if you called on the Lord, if you know he's asking you to come be baptized, come and say it. I'm just going to invite you to come out this door right here. You come right now. We're going to sing a couple verses here. You come out, and if you want to be baptized, we'll celebrate that.